things. On Sunday mornings, I typically like to preach about things that are really pressing or passionate on my heart. And spiritual warfare has been one of those things. It, it, it really has. Um, uh, I, I kind of felt some of it during the pandemic, but then I listened to some stories of some ex-Navy SEALs that served in Iraq, and when they were sharing principles that they learned out on the physical battlefield, I thought it got me thinking about how those same principles translate and we can learn how to fight our spiritual warfare. Because whether you and I believe it or not, whether we're even engaged in warfare or not, whether you woke up this morning thinking it was just another Sunday or not, the enemy, Satan, is going to attack you. He's going to work. I don't know everything that he can cause. I do know that ultimately God is in control. However, he is allowed to do some things on this earth. He is allowed to, to launch attacks towards you and me. And if he doesn't launch them himself, he will certainly try to use the circumstances in your life, the disappointments, the discouragements, um, everything outside of our control. He can try to levy that against us and make it difficult to long for and search for and have a relationship with our God. And so we have to be aware of the invisible battle that happens in our lives every single morning. As a soldier, you, 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 wouldn't even, you wouldn't even attempt to go out into a battlefield without some sort of gear or some sort of armor. And how often do we wake up any given morning and we, we turn on the coffee, we're listening to whatever we're listening to, we're trying to get everybody ready and dressed and out, and we don't, even, we don't even think about God, or we don't even think about what lays ahead in the spiritual realm. But if we can just take a moment, maybe every morning, and just say, Lord, I'm going to put on your armor. I'm going to go out there. I know I'm going to be attacked. I know it's going to even feel like it's overwhelming. But you haven't asked me to take care of everything. You've just asked me to trust you. You've asked me to be aware of my need for you, and you will give me the daily strength and protection I need to get through this day. But let me be aware. Don't let me be fooled by the enemy. Don't let me be ambushed. Don't let me have a surprise attack. Help me understand in all situations that you are for me and that you want me to win this. And Lord, please give me strength. So they, they, these people, um, the, the ex-Navy SEALs, they, they shared some principles on, on how they navigated um, some of the missions that they did over in Iraq. And um, there was one particular thing that, again, stuck out to me. There's all these things that stuck out, but, but another principle that, that stuck out to me was what they called this, cover and move, cover and move. And they told stories about how they worked in teams, you know, SEAL teams and things like that, and they would go about certain missions but one of the tactics that they used was called cover and move. And let's just, to make it simple, just think about two people. Okay, you got two soldiers here, and, and they're trying to get into an area, or they're trying to get out of an area. And one of the tactics or the strategies they use is cover and move. Meaning, one of us is going to, you know, take their gun and provide cover for the other person so that they can move. They've either got to get into something or get out of something. And one soldier provides cover fire for another person. Now, the other person, they can't just stay there. You know, in, in war times, you can't be stagnant. You've got a mission. You need to either accomplish it or you need to get out. You need to do something. You can't just stay where you're at. Because the longer you stay where you're at, the more the enemy knows your location. And it just creates a whole number of, of issues. And so your job is to move. You say, well, I don't want to move. I'm being shot at. I'm being fired at. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff whizzing over my head. Yeah, well, you have someone to provide some cover fire. They're going to cover, and then you're going to move. And when you move to where you need to get, when you get to the place where you're a little safer and, and you can help, then it's your job to provide cover fire for the other person so that they can move. And basically, you do this leapfrog approach, right? One person provides cover fire so the other one can move, then when the other person gets in position, he or she turns around and provides cover fire for his fellow soldier, and that fellow soldier can move, and they just keep doing this back and forth, this kind of teamwork to wherever they get to where they need to go or they get out of wherever they need to get out of. And when I heard these stories of cover and move, this, this intricate, synchronized way these soldiers methodically go about accomplishing a mission, I thought that's exactly what Christians need to do. We need to cover and we need to move. 
We need to work together. If we're going to be in a spiritual battle, yes, it's important to put on the armor. Yes, it's important to desensitize yourself to the overwhelming nature of the attacks of the enemy, but you cannot, and, and I would even agree, the biblical case is you should not ever do this battle alone. You can't. The enemy is firing at you. And as important as it is for you to know your Bible and to be able to fire back truths when the enemy attacks you, you need some help. You are going to go through a season. You are going to experience a situation where you need somebody to provide cover fire for you. When someone is providing cover fire for you as a soldier, you, you, just, you just move. You just do what you need to do to function you don't worry about necessarily firing back. Maybe, maybe you do in, in little bits, but, but you're more concentrated on, on getting to where you need or accomplishing the next objective while someone else is providing cover fire for you. And I just think that's so key. All of us, all of us in here, regardless of age, regardless of financial situations or family situations, we're just going to go through spiritual times of dryness. We're just going to, you know, I told you that, that this is going to be overwhelming. And, and part of the overwhelming nature of the attacks of the enemy is to rely on God. But there's also going to be times where we rely on God through the help of other human beings that are around us. It's just this idea that at times in our lives when we're fighting a spiritual battle, we're going to need the help of each other. Someone is going to need to cover for us while we get through whatever we're getting through, and then when we get to a better place, when, when life is, has kind of allowed us to get our legs beneath us and, and we're feeling a little stronger, we need to look to see who we can cover, who we can help out, someone else who's in need. And it's happening all the time. We're helping somebody or somebody's helping us. We're in this together to accomplish the mission that Christ has given us. And this is actually a biblical principle. In fact, the metaphor for the church, we talk about the church in a lot of ways. We talk about it as the bride of Christ. We talk about it um, as, a, as a building or a gathering space. But, but the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians actually gives us a beautiful metaphor, which really, it, it, it is the whole cover and move idea. It is the cover and move principle. And perhaps necessarily he wasn't thinking about spiritual warfare in this, it, it, it's so key. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12, which is where we're going to stop, and I'm going to be kind of jumping around here just to save us some time so that you're not here for four hours, but um, I did want to share the metaphor that the Apostle Paul talks about our life as Christians in relationship to one another. This, this is what he says, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Just as a body, a human body, through the one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. So it is with Christ. It, it's a beautiful metaphor because, you know, anyone who's studied medicine or, you know, thought about their own body or learned an anatomy or, or however that works, we see that, that, yes, we are one person, okay? We are one body, and yet there's so many different parts of our body that are all interconnected, interdependent, and are very, very important to one another. And the Apostle Paul says, so it is with those people who have chosen to follow Christ. Yes, together co collectively, you form the body of Christ, but each one of you has a specific role and responsibility to play. You're like a body with different members, although you're all unified under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you all have different parts to play. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is made up, it's not made up of one part, but of many. Many. And then he goes to explain two key components of the body of Christ, or what it means to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. And he continues with the body metaphor. He says, listen. If the, ear, if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason alone, stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, 
where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? And he continues, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. So he talks about all these different members, but he says, listen guys, even though you have different roles, responsibilities, you have different gifts, you have different tasks that you're part of, no one part is more valuable than another. Okay? How many of our soldiers are valuable that go over and fight these missions? Every single one of them. It takes all of them. Yeah, you might have certain soldiers that are on the front lines and they have guns and they're taking, you know, ground and doing all these things. But then you have other soldiers that, that maybe stay behind and, and they're doing intelligence in order to, to get the location of where the soldiers need to be. Um, you, you may have other generals or, or higher up leaders that are uh, coordinating different attacks by different um, you know, platoons or command units and all these kind of things. In, in fact, you might even have groups and, and they're either chaplains or they're medics. And maybe at times they don't even carry a gun. But if you get hurt or you, you need your soul saved, they're absolutely important to the whole mission of, uh, of what's happening in, in, in the military attack. And the Apostle Paul says, listen guys, every single one of you are important. Just because you're not a pastor, just because you don't play or sing in the worship team, just because you're, you're not on the, the cleaning team, doesn't mean you're, you're not important. In fact, every single person is important. Sometimes, you know, I, I think we, we get it mixed up with, with stages, you know. Uh, we can become too complacent and think, well... The people on stage, they're the real heroes. They're the people that are doing the real ministry. The people I see on TV, they're really knocking it out of the park. But actually, it's, it's the exact opposite. The people on stage are, are actually there to get the people in the pews encouraged and inspired to live for Jesus in their daily lives. There's only one of me. There's many more of you. And ultimately, my job is to help you get in the game and live the life that God has called you to win. I mean, of course, coaches get a lot of credit if, they're, if their teams are able to win. Obviously, you know, you, you, you want to hire good coaches. But let me tell you, good coaches need good players. And, and in fact, the coaches never really score points. It's actually the players that score the points. So a good coach is going to help their players win. And the Apostle Paul says, listen, you don't have to have a title. You don't have to be on a staff at a church. You, you don't have to do something that's well known and well applauded in order to matter. Every single responsibility that is done in the church is valuable and it, and it totally makes a difference. I mean, and it really does take all of us. I mean, you know, the more we're hearing about church growth and and church engagement, basically what it takes to get a visitor to come back to a church, it really is far more than what I'm doing now. You might think, well, we got good music and, and we've got good preaching, but if you don't have a welcoming person in the parking lot, if you don't have somebody to kind of take care of your facility and make sure it's clean and make sure there's not trash in the yard and, and you know, we, we just seal coated or had our parking lot seal coated. If you don't do those things, you know, if, if, if lights are out in the church and, you know, it smells funky, that all plays a part. I mean, think about it. You, you know this. If you go to a restaurant and you might like a dish or you might like a, a certain thing, but you go into the bathroom and it looks like, you know, just grossness has exploded and somebody's vomited on the floor. You, you, you might start to wonder, you know, if this is what the bathroom looks like, I'm wondering what the kitchen looks like that I can't see. Hello. It all plays a part into it, the whole experience. You might like the, you might like the food. You might like the facility. But if you have a bad waiter or a waitress, uh-oh, you might not want to go back to that place. See, every single part plays a part. And that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to tell us. You're all valuable. Regardless of what you do, you are valuable. And then he, he says this, not only are you valuable to one another, no one is more important than another. You actually need each other. Even if you're one of the famous parts of the body, even if you're a hand or a foot or an eye or an ear, even if you get one of the senses, right, and you get all the credit, you know, you still need other parts of the body. 
This is what he continues. He says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the hand cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. <laughs> right? I mean, how silly would that be, right? How silly would it be for, for one of your eyes to say, you know, I, I can see everything that's going on. I don't need this hand or this head to do anything. You know, I don't, I don't, it's, it's not a big deal. Or, or the head to say the feet, you know, hey, hey, I, I'm the one that's got the brown. I, I don't need you. I mean, just think about this. Um, stub your toe, <laughs> stub your toe on anything. If you're walking through, you hit a dresser or you, you step on a Lego or something, and you will feel the interconnectedness of your body. You will, your toe will start to throb. Your brain will send messages up and down. Ouch, ouch. Oh, my gosh. You might even see your, yourself reaching up to, to kind of to let your hand massage your toe or something. And, and all of a sudden, your vocal cords warm up. And, and I, I say this joke, you know, you start singing Amazing Grace because I know no one curses around here. We just say Amazing Grace. But, but you will feel your body will rush to the aid of that little tiny pinky toe that got stubbed. We all need each other. And the Apostle Paul says this is exactly what it is. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. They seem weaker, but they're indispensable. You might not know everything your appendix does, but if your appendix <laughs> gets appendicitis, um, it will affect your whole body. You can ask my wife about that. She totally knows. She, uh, maybe I, she's like, no, no. Okay, anyway. Yeah. Just such a small thing, but if it goes wrong, it would affect the whole body. And he says this. In fact, if one part suffers, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. There's, there's, not, just, there's not just equal value spread out among all the members of the church. There is an interdependentness. As a pastor, I need you just as much as you need me. If you didn't come or you didn't join us online, and thank you for doing that, if, if you didn't connect with us in person or online, I'd have nobody to preach to. That's just, that's just a simple fact, right? But if you didn't have a pastor, if you didn't have a leadership, perhaps you, you, you'd have struggle or have a hard time setting the direction of the church. I need you to do everything that God has gifted you to do, and you need me to do everything that God has gifted me to do. I recognize that I might get some of the credit because, you know, pastors share a lot of the credit. They share a lot of the blame. But look, we all are important. We're all dependent on each other. And when one member suffers, we all suffer. If one of you is losing, we're all losing. But if one of you is winning, we can all celebrate the win because we're all connected together. You're only as strong as your weakest link or your weakest player. And a church is only as strong as really its, its weakest member or the person that needs help the most. Cover and move. I help you get to where you need to go. And there's going to come a time where I'm going to need you to help me get to where I need to go. Cover and move. Now... As I talk about this verse, when one person suffers, we all suffer, and the interdependentness, um, I want to talk about something that really, really struck a chord with me, probably more than I even thought about. Um, it was listening to these ex-Navy SEALs talk about friendly fire. Talk about friendly fire. In fact, um, and perhaps you, you may not have really known this, but in places like Iraq, this urban warfare, we fought an enemy over there that um, didn't fight by the same rules that we did. I mean, you know, in America, we're not going to want to spend millions of dollars building a building only to blow it up to go get one person, okay? We're going to try to do everything we can to save this building that we've spent millions of dollars. But the, the insurgents or, you know, the, the radical jihadists, you know, they didn't care. If they blew up a building and only killed one person, you know, you just blow it up. You know, who cares? We have to live here, but who cares, Right? Now, as Americans, we're going to want to protect hostages. We're going to want to protect our soldiers. But the, the people that we were fighting over there, they didn't care if one of their guys necessarily got hurt. You know, I mean, it was just part of the collateral damage. Now, maybe they had some special people that they wanted to take care of, but, you know, if, if they harmed somebody, I mean, they had suicide bombers. I mean, that, that's just right there. I mean, and just think about that. Americans, we don't have that. I mean, just wrap your minds around that. We do not have... Americans that basically 
uh, have a mission as, as a suicide person. Now, uh, you know, we've had many brave men and women who have given their lives, but we don't use suicide as a military strategy in America. We just do not do that. But over there, that's what they did. They just did not fight by the rules. And you can imagine how difficult this made the warfare you know, over in Afghanistan because you didn't know who was on the team and who wasn't on the team. It wasn't like everybody wore the same jersey. Okay, they looked similar, and maybe they didn't speak the language. You know, Americans, we didn't speak the language. It was, it was very difficult. And you can imagine, with the war-torn area, with not being able to tell who's on the team and who's not, with the, the ruthlessness of, of the enemy that you were fighting, you might want to say, you know what, guys, let's just give you, you, give you guys a break. Do the best you can, but we understand that you're not always going to have the best information and, you know, friendly fire just happens. But from these ex-Navy SEALs, I, I, I really heard their heart in this. The one thing they avoided at all costs was friendly fire. The most disgraceful thing our American soldiers face, the most thing they tried to avoid at all cost was friendly fire. And, you know, it, it was just kind of like to me, like, you know, hey, I know, I know this stuff happens. You, you, can't, you can't beat yourself about it. But, but no. In fact, one of them told a story that said they were about to, they were about to shoot someone on another building that they thought was, was, you know, an enemy fighter. And they couldn't positively ID it. It turns out it was one of our men. And at the last second, they pulled the, the, the order to, to shoot that person. And so they all breathed this in, incredible sigh of relief. But the, the Navy SEAL that talked about you know, stopping this order from happening, he said, you know, if, if I'd have gone ahead and we'd have shot one of our own men, he said, my career would have been over. That's it for me. I'm done. And I'm like, really? I mean, you, you, you're willing to throw away your whole thing just because you made such a mistake that, that was so common? I mean, you, you can just imagine how difficult it was. Yeah, friendly fire. We don't do it. It's, it's the most disgraceful thing that, that we can do. And, and it kind of makes sense... When you think about the end of what happens in friendly fire, at some point, at least in America, I can't speak for other armies, but in America, at some point, you're going to have to tell the family that their loved one has passed away. Now, that's bad, right? That's incredibly bad. I can't even imagine that. But what's worse than that is having to explain to that family member that as brave and as heroic as their soldier was... They died not at the hands of the enemy, but they died at the hands of a friendly. Someone who was supposed to have their back took their life. And yeah, there are accidents, but you can imagine these soldiers, there's no room for that kind of error. We check, we double check, we triple check, we make sure we eliminate the possibility of any sort of friendly fire. Because how awful would it be to explain to a family who has children that they lost their life because you made an accident, you made a mistake. Now, when I thought about how real soldiers in America treat friendly fire, you know what I thought about? I thought about how much as the church in America are we missing the idea of friendly fire among church members? Amen. We're so quick to, to criticize other churches we're so quick to criticize other pastors, other members. This church is too big. They've got thousands of people there. They must be drinking Kool-Aid. You know, There's no reason a church should be that big. They, they don't know each other. Or as big churches, they criticize smaller churches. they got nothing going on, no life in there. I mean, if, if there was something, if God really cared about them, they'd be growing and they'd have a bunch of people, so they must not have stuff going on. That church over there, they don't, they don't believe in speaking in tongues. So they don't have anything going on there. They're not even preaching the whole gospel. Hey, this church over there, they, they swing from the chandeliers. They, they, they have no reverence whatsoever. They, they run laps. So clearly they're uneducated and they don't understand you know, what it's like to serve in reverence to God. Hey, hey this church, they, they take communion every single Sunday. They, they take it way too seriously. Hey, this church, they, they hardly ever take communion. And boy, I can't even believe that they would... You know, not do that. I mean, we attack each other so much. This, this is a church filled with Democrats. This is a church filled with Republicans. This is a white church. This is a black church. But let me tell you, if God has a message for the church in 2021, he would say this. Stop dividing yourself. Stop shooting at yourself. 
You're on the same team, and if you can't get it together and fight against the enemy in this America, what are you doing? What are you doing? Gosh, we have a thousand reasons to be divided in our country. We have zero reasons to be divided in the church of Jesus Christ. Because it's not about your politics, it's not about your race, it's not about your ethnicity and your financial status. It's about Jesus, what He did on the cross, what He did on the resurrection. And the worst thing that we could do would be to have to stand before God and say that someone stopped going to church, not because of discouragement that was hurled at them from the enemy, but because of something we did. Something we said. How awful would that be to stand before God and say, this person stopped going to our church not because of something that was preached or or the enemy attacking them. It was something I did. It was friendly fire. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. And the call that I hear is saying, Jordan, you're in such a big battle right now in the enemy You've got to cover and move. You cannot afford to let little nitpicky issues keep you from connecting with your brothers and sisters in Christ. I feel more than ever, we're we're trying to get our community service going again, by the way. We've had some emails about that between us and Old Brick and and Edgemont and and Bethel. We're trying to get that going. But I, I feel more than ever that we've got to let these little nitpicky things go as much as we can. And even in our church, even in our church, I don't, I don't know if there's any real, you know, strong division in our church, but, but all of us is at Bain Chapel, whether we're meeting in person, whether you're meeting online, um, regardless of how much money you make versus another member or your family situation, like, we are all on the same team. And we need to remove any sort of friendly fire from our area. Just as the Apostle Paul says this, now he finishes, you are the body of Christ. You're the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Cover and move. Cover and move. So, and here's here's probably why I was most excited this morning, okay? I'm sharing all these things. I want to give you an assignment. Now, you've probably noticed, um, when I towards get to the end of the sermon, I'm ready to do something, or at least I'm ready to tell you to do something, and I want to be as specific as I can. And you know what? I, I just I have an assignment for you this morning, and I want to get as practical as I possibly can because I'm, I'm really convinced that if soldiers in Iraq couldn't do what they did without the teamwork of other you know Navy SEALs and Marines and Green Berets and you know you know just Army fighters and Air Force, if, if they all had to cover and move for each other, how in the world are we going to get past the enemy if we don't cover and move for each other? How, I mean, how are we going to fight the invisible battle without covering and move? So I have an assignment for you, okay? And I'm going to this as easy as I know how to make it. Here, here's what I want you to do, okay? I want you to schedule a time to meet with another Christian within the next 14 days. You, you get two weeks, okay? I want you to schedule. And you're saying, Who, who's he talking about? I'm talking about every single person that's here in attendance or watching online. Every single person that is a part of Main Chapel, PH Church, and hey, I would love for you to participate, even if you're just watching this as a guest or you're not even a member, I would love for you to do this. I think we need to get more intentional about this than ever before. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to schedule to meet with another Christian for the next 14 days. It could be over coffee. It could be for lunch. You could have dinner. You could just go over to their house, or they could come over here. Like whatever, whatever it takes, I want you to have an intentional meeting with another Christian. Okay, and and let's come on. Let me let me let me just encourage you. Don't just take the easiest route possible. Okay, if you're married in here, don't just say, "Well, I'm going to meet with my spouse." You know. Okay. Yes, that's great. But what I would really love for you to do is is meet with someone in this church if you can. I'd, I'd love for you to do that. But if you don't feel like you have that closer relationships with the people that are in here or maybe online right now, just meet with another Christian you respect. And that could be a member of your family. It could be a cousin. It could be a sister. Just just someone that isn't just, you know, like live in the next, you know, 
next to yours in your house. I, I want you to work a little bit to do this, okay? And this you're going to have to schedule this, okay? You're going to schedule a time to meet with them. Now, maybe you're listening to this online or maybe you're in person and say, Jordan, this whole COVID stuff, I don't, I don't know if I necessarily feel meeting or the person that I'm thinking of, I don't, I don't know if they would meet with me. Get this, good news, I'm going to COVID-proof this whole thing, okay? If you can't meet with them in person, and that's what I would rather you do, if there are any COVID-related issues, schedule a video call or a phone call. Yeah, yeah, I want everybody to participate. I, I, I feel like it, it's best to meet in person if you can. But if you can't, I still want you to connect intentionally with another Christian within the next 14 days. I mean, the, the clock is starting now. you got 14 days to do this. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to meet with them. If you can't meet with them in person, do it over a video call. That would be your next step. If you, know, you have smartphones, you can FaceTime or you can do Skype or whatever you want to do. Or, or just give them a phone call. You can give them a phone call. Now... Maybe this person is not listed, listening to the sermon, and, they, and it's totally awkward, and you're not used to asking people. I've already thought of that, too. Here, here's what you're going to say. You're just going to contact them, and here's what you're going to say. You're going to say, our pastor wants everyone in our church to have a meeting with another Christian because he believes we can encourage one another. You don't even have to say it with a good attitude. You can just put it all on me. You know, say, you know, I'm sorry. I know it's late. I know you're busy, but... My pastor, just, he, just, he just wants everybody in our church to do this little meeting and, you know, we're friends and, you know, wh whatever it takes. I just, you, you just use the script, okay? Now, now here's what you're going to tell him. He wants us to discuss a couple questions and pray for each other out loud. That's a very important part. Would that be okay with you? Right? That's how you say it. My pastor wants us to meet. Would you be okay with doing that? We can meet over lunch, coffee, dinner, or I can just come over. All we're really going to do, i got three things in mind. We're going to discuss a couple questions. We're going to ask each other a couple questions. And then he wants us to pray for each other out loud. Now, maybe you don't pray out loud. I get that. That's going to be a little uncomfortable thing for you. Um, but but I, I think there's something powerful about listening to another person pray for you. To hear, hear them pray for you. I mean, you know, as Christians, we say, well, we'll pray for you all the time. And you might do it. But it's great to be sitting across the table of another person and hear them. Now, you think, Jordan, okay, I get it. But you mean pray out loud at Starbucks? Like, are you, do you really mean pray out loud at McDonald's? That's really what you're saying. What if we disturb some people? What if, what if we bother some people? Good. <laughs> Good. Our, our secular world needs to know that people pray, still pray, still pray over their food, still pray over people. And I don't want you to get legalistic about the food thing. I'm just saying they need to hear. I, I think it's good for them to hear us pray. So if it makes people uncomfortable, if they throw you out, hey, this is at the end of the meeting. So if they throw you out after you pray, that's cool. You've already done your thing. But make sure you pray, okay? Now, if you want to take a picture of this or if you want to write this down, this is what I want you to ask when you have the meeting, okay? It's super simple. You're just going to do three things. You can talk about all you want to talk about. You can talk about how the Braves won the World Series. You can talk about the weather. You can talk about this COVID mess. You can talk about the last election. You, you, can, you can talk about anything you want. I just want to make sure that before you finish that meeting, you've, you've, you've gone over three things, okay? This is what I want you to do. The first question, I want you to ask each other, can you please share a story of a time when God really came through for you? Can you tell me of a story? Can you, would you mind sharing a time where you were really praying, you really needed God to come through, and he did? Can you, you tell me what that was like? Tell me what you were feeling. You know what I think this is going to help you do? This is going to help you encourage each other. It's going to help remind both of you that God is still in the miracle business that he's still in the healing business, that he's still in the make a way business, that he's still in the I will fight for you business. Because God did it in the past, we know that he can do it in the present, and we know that as we trust him, he will continue to do things in the future. So you're each going to share a story where God really came through for you. Now, you, you have the advantage here because you're already hearing this. You already got to, you know, you can really spend some time thinking about this. The other person you ask might be on the spot, but just think about share a story. Now, here's number two. All right, after you shared your stories, you're going to ask each other, is there any area in your life you felt the enemy has been attacking you lately? Now, maybe they don't 
believe in the whole devil thing, but chances are if they're another Christian, they already believe that the enemy's attacking, okay? So they're, they're already on board with this to some extent. You just need to ask them, is there any area of your life you feel like the enemy's really coming at you? Is, is, do you have something going on at work? Is something going on with your family that you wouldn't mind sharing? Is something going on with you physically? Is something going on with you mentally? Do you just, do you, is there any area of your life you feel like the enemy is just really making it hard for you? This is going to be good for two reasons. Number one, it's going to give you something to pray about for the other person. But number two, it's going to help you understand that you're, you're not alone in this. You're not. And hopefully it will help you see that you really need each other. You're going to need their prayers as they provide cover fire for you. And you're going to need to pray for them as you provide what you can provide for them. And maybe, it would be, it would be even really cool, maybe in that moment you would turn into the answer to their prayer. Maybe, maybe they say something to you like, you know, I just financially right now, it's just a push. And God does something in your heart and you slide them a check or you slide them some cash. And all right of a sudden, right there, you just became the answer to somebody's prayer. Maybe they, they tell you they need something. And you already have three or four of them. And, and right there, well, I'll take care of that. We'll, we'll fix that. Cover and move. Cover and move. I think that would be awesome. But who knows what the Lord's going to do with this. Number three, pray for each other out loud. Take turns. Now, I've done this in a coffee shop before, even a Christian coffee shop. And it, it's probably going to feel a little weird. It just is. Especially if you're not used to praying out loud. It's going to feel a little weird. But I want you to take turns. You say, well, it's a little uncomfortable. Can I tell you something? Spiritual warfare is uncomfortable. It is. It's uncomfortable to have the enemy shooting at you. When you pray for a fellow Christian, you're providing cover fire for them. You know what you're doing? You're shooting back at the enemy on their behalf. You say, well, oh, this is weird, Jordan. I get it. I know it. But I want you to cover and move. I think the church would be so much stronger today if we realized we were on the same team and we covered and we moved. There's going to come times where I'm going to need your help, even as a pastor. I'm going to need encouragement. I'm going to be down. You, you've already been there for me. I, I've already been through a couple really big things that you guys helped me through. You covered for me so that I could get to a better place. And thankfully, I feel like I am. So maybe you need someone like me. Maybe you need some help. We do it together. We never do it alone. You realize they changed the army slogan. It was an army of one, and then they changed it to army strong. <laughs> like, y'all, we, no, we're not an army of one. We're only army strong. We're only as strong as we are connected together as our weakest soldier. We're all together. Let's stand up and pray. This is going to be a little different this morning. Typically... Um, we have like an altar call, but what I really want you to do is I, I just really want you to take up your assignments. So obviously you can pray about anything as we have a time of prayer. Certainly, if you're not a Christian, um, this is a great time to ask Jesus into your heart to save you because of what he did on the cross and resurrection. For those um, in the world that God loves so much that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. So this is your opportunity to get saved. For the rest of us, like I said, you could pray about anything, but, but, but I would just really pray that you, you do this assignment. You got 14 days. You got 14 days to meet with another Christian who you have no idea might need you so much. You're going to initiate that. You're going you're gonna to share with them good stories. You're going to find out where the enemy is attacking them, and, and you're going to pray for them right then and there. And I think... I just can't, it's just, who knows what God's going to do. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this principle of cover and move. Lord, it's so easy to realize that, you know, we're doing our fight. We're, we're trying to move on. We're trying to take a step and, and not realize how, how we really do need each other. Lord, we don't, we don't it, it, it's not just about, meeting in person versus meeting online. Lord, we, we need to get in each other's lives, even if the best way to do that right now is through a phone call. We've got to figure out how we can help other people and they can help us, understanding that, 
No one is less valuable than each other. We're only as strong as our weakest link. If one of us is suffering, we're all suffering and paying the consequences of that. So Lord, help us pray and provide cover fire for Christians around us who really need some help right now. And Lord, if someone is providing prayers and cover fire for us, help us have the courage to move and get better while someone else is supporting us. But Lord, help us understand we need each other. We cannot be divided. We cannot be fighting each other. We have to be helping each other, bearing one another's burdens, and in so doing, fulfill the law of Christ. Help us do that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.